Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. We just finished up the first week of store championships and I'm here with Steven to go over his Zoro deck list that he was able to sweep the first week of store championships with and he won two of the winner Luffy cards. So how's it going Steven? It's going pretty good. Yep, and it's good to have you back on the channel and congratulations on winning the two Luffy cards and the two store championships. Yeah, thank you. We actually did have you on for a Zoro deck profile in set two, and we talked about it a little bit. You said it, you feel like you're playing a completely different deck from then. So what's changed from set two to set three? Um, so I would break it down into uh, two parts. Basically, the first part is the deck is more efficient. And the second part is, as opposed to speed, which I would say is like was more set one and two, this one's more focused on like power and control. Um, so it's not as fast, but you do get bigger bodies. They're harder to, well, some of them are harder to take out. Um, and then um, uh, you can you can control the board well, and then you can shift into just being super aggressive after that. Um, so yeah, it's 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 less focused on just kind of pounding into life as fast as you can, and more focused on just I would just say like kind of total domination of the board and then the life, like even the hand as well. So. Right, yeah, and there's a lot of set three cards that we got that really improve red all around. You know, we got the new Marco, and we got uh, Vent Searcher, and there's a couple of other cards that you can see in your list here that I didn't bring up, but yeah, let's just go over that deck list. Go ahead, it's all you. Okay, sure. So the leader, of course, is Zoro. He's uh, typical five life, five K power. His ability is once he's got a Dawn underneath him, he increases the power of all the characters that are on board by 1,000. From there, we have four of Izo. Uh, it's a set three searcher. It finds uh, just a Whitebeard Pirates card, other than Izo, of course. And we got four of Buggy, another searcher from set three. This one finds red event cards. After that, we have four of Otama, of course, tried and true. I, I don't think any red deck doesn't run her. Uh, just the 2K counter, as well as the minus 2K power when it comes down to uh, an opposing character. From there is four of Makino, another mostly 2K counter. When you activate main by resting it, you can buff one of your one cost red characters by 3000 power, which also combos with your teach, which I'll get to. But yeah, otherwise mostly a 2K counter. Uh, then we got four of Curly to Dawn, another searcher. That one searches out one cost red characters. So everything I just named, you can find those. Two of Jozu, it's honestly mostly just the 2k counter you're gonna be pretty desperate if you ever play him on board so pretty much just exclusively a 2k counter uh searchable from Ezo and from whitebeard pirates of course after that we have my favorite personally four of marshall d teach another new card it's a four cost six thousand power but its ability is pretty interesting and part of why this deck is so efficient when you swing with teach you can remove a 4k power character from your board to draw a card and gain 1,000 power. So of course, coupled with Zoro's ability, that is an 8K swing with only a one dawn commitment to your leader. That is, it's a, to me, a very powerful card, and then it also draws you a card as well. So drawing is amazing, of course, in any deck, so that card is just incredibly powerful. Four of the Marco from set two, it's the 5K blocker Marco that when you're at two life or less, when it's KO'd, you can bring it back rested by ditching a Whitebeard card from your hand. There's two of King Dew. It's, it's, this one's iffy, and the Whitebeard matchup is very good to play on board. And then just in general, it's good to have if you don't have the next card I'm about to talk about. Otherwise, it's just a 1K counter, or you can pitch it for the Marco that I just talked about. Next up is the set three Marco, five cost, 6,000 power. On play, he KOs a 3,000 power character or less. And then when this Marco is KO'd, you can actually ditch an event card to bring him back rested. From there, we have two Edward Newgate. Of course, this is uh, from set two, the big boss, nine cost, 10,000 power. And then of course, we're not running Newgate, so that first part doesn't count. But the second part, tuck two Dawn underneath him. And when he swings, you KO a 3,000 power or less character. From there, we go into our event cards. And of course, you need several of these as well just to make Buggy viable and your Marco. The first one is four of Whitebeard Pirates. It's a one cost search event that finds a Whitebeard card. This one is mostly going to be used to save your Marcos, uh, admittedly. But if you're in the early game and you have one in hand and you really want to find like your Teach or, or your Marco or something, it's definitely good to use. But 
towards like the mid to late game, you're definitely going to want to just hold on to these to save your Marcos. From there, we have Guard Point 2 of. Uh, it's just a 1 cost 3k counter. 4 of Rattle Beam. And the way you're going to use this, of course, is when you're at 2 or less life, it is a 1 cost 4k counter. Otherwise, it's just a 1 cost 2k, but you know, you're you're in trouble if you're using it like that. <laughs> and then after that is two of Red Hawk, which is a two cost 4,000 counter that also uh, KOs a character on your opponent's side of the board with 4,000 power or less. So that's the list. Yeah, and looking at this list, we already talked about this is so much different. I think the biggest thing that stands out to me is now that you can search events, it is more efficient and you do play a lot more defense than Zoro typically used to run. You know, it used to just be a smack face kind of deck, and now it can play the uh, defensive game at the end, and that's something that you've been really good at in your run. Playing against me, I can attest to that, because <laughs> it's very hard to take that last life against you. The combination of Marcos and the events just really make it tough to close out games against your Zoro. And that's kind of how you play, right? You don't have any problem taking the first two to three life so that you can get down to two. That way you can make use of your radical beams and the blocker Marco ability. So yeah, uh, the list, it's been working for you. Obviously you had a really dominant week, but are there any cards that maybe you think that you could add or maybe some that you've tried out and just didn't like, but were still worthy cards to consider? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, really all is dependent on what kind of matchups you're seeing. In my opinion, this build is generally pretty good into everything, but things that I would consider, of course, there's always like Jet Pistol, if you really need removal. That could always be coupled with like Otama as well. Jet Pistol's definitely a solid card, especially if you're seeing it off trigger. Diablo Jambe would be a solid one. Of course, you're really only going to be able to use that on your leader. But just as a final swing, you know, being able to make your character unblockable, especially if you're playing a lot of like black, like smoker decks or uh, maybe even Luchi decks, like get those sticky blockers down, you know, you just don't even worry about them. If you want to put the last life away, throw a Diablo Jambe down and just swing right through. Other than that, of course, there's always just the classic build of throwing the uh, Zoros in there. Zoro is still a very powerful card. There's nothing wrong with him at all. For me, I'm kind of valuing power over speed. But a 3-drop 5k that becomes a 6k with one Dawn Commitment onto your leader is definitely a solid card, no matter what's going on, at least at this point in the game. So that is uh, certainly a card worth considering. It all just depends on what your locals look like, what your matches look like, your preference, your playstyle. And, you know, there's more stuff as well. The red just has so many options right now that it's actually hard to nail down just a few uh, cards. There's tons of them. But I would say, you know, starting with something like this as a base, and then kind of adjusting from there. But those are some picks that I would consider for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. Red has so many options. And all three of those cards you mentioned are actually in my Zoro deck. And it is kind of my play style to have some removal. Or, you know, I really hate losing to Edward Newgate. So I throw Diablo John <laughs> Bays in mine. But uh, yeah, Jet oh. Pistol, it can get rid of characters on board, of course. It's good off of Trigger. And yeah, it's uh, it's just a classic jet pistol. We know what it does. And Diablo Jean Bay, like you were talking about, just to go through blockers, because I do think the blocker Marcos are kind of defining the meta right now. So you see it in Newgate, you see it in Ace, you see it in Zoro and the Luffy's that are out there. So yep. just to you know use Diablo Jean Bay just for that final swing is uh, pretty strong, especially because both events are searchable. So those are two cards. But then Rush Zoro is just such good value just for three costs, being able to swing 5k, but also, you know, with the Dawn tucked under your leader, it's a 6k. So yeah, uh, just such good value. And it can come out of nowhere for a final you just, swing. You just got to make sure you swing with the Zoro though. Oh yes. Uh, we're going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. So we did play uh, my Zoro into his Zoro, just for some context here. And I did throw out my Rush Zoro, and I didn't attack with it the first turn, which I do think was the right move. But the second time, I definitely should have swung with it. I felt pretty good about my board state, but I was playing a little bit too conservative. But I was a little rusty. It was my first time playing Zoro in a while, so... 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> super pre-releases do not count. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but yeah, that, that was a misplay on my end for sure. But yeah, um, speaking of, you know, misplays and getting used to the deck, what are some tips that you have for people playing your version of this deck? Yeah, so uh, there is um, quite a lot of things that I can think of that I would want to advise people on. But just to keep it short and simple, you want to go second with this deck. Nothing feels better than dropping Teach on turn two and just having him out there. You know, even if he only gets a couple swings off or even if he really only gets one with that ability, I mean, you're getting so much out of him that just having him on turn two it really makes a difference. So one of the biggest tips I can give is you want to go second. You might feel like, oh, I got a lot of one drops that surge and going first just to get the first hit in or something like that. But this deck thrives on going second. Beyond that, there's thoughts that I have in game where there will be a good turn to board like a five drop Marco, but I'll have a teach in hand. And you have to really weigh the decision on whether or not it's better to drop the Marco or drop the teach. And a lot of times when I come to those situations, I just drop the teach because I, I just feel like having... Like, first of all, he's already, you know, a big body on board. Uh, so you're still getting that. You're getting the draw. You're getting all that. But you're also just maintaining a counter in hand if you happen to need it. Um, you know, sometimes you're not going to. And then you just drop the, you know, the Marco on your next turn or something. But um, I, I always try to opt for dropping Teach um, as early as I possibly can. And as frequently as I possibly can. Um, because, again, and, you know, this is kind of going back to what I said earlier about this card being my favorite in a, in a set. Um... If you have like two teaches on board and you already have like a buggy on board or, or a Dadon and you have another buggy or another Dadon in your hand, I mean, you're getting two 8K swings off with two draws and all it's costing you is a couple of like small cards on board. And especially if you can like tuck a Don under Zoro, tuck a Don under your Dadon, swing with Dadon for five, it lives. And then eventually you get to swing with Teach, pop the Dadon, get a draw. That's an 8K swing. And then you board like a buggy, and then you go with your other teach, uh, swing, pop the buggy, and get another draw. I mean, that's two cards that you drew, two 8K swings, and that's not even counting like your leader swing and then the 5K swing with, with, with Dadon. Those are the type of uh, moves you have to think about. So there might be turns where you feel like, you know, oh, I, I should board the Marco to get like value to KO this, you know, this little 3K or this 2K guy that they have or this blocker. But I, I would wager, um, if you have a teach in hand, reconsider. <laughs> um, then there's things like, you know, how much Dawn to hold back for events. Like NJ pointed out, I do not mind at all taking early damage. I think that your life is a resource, and you need to see it as that. And the only time you really need to be concerned is when you're getting within lethal range. So when you're down to, like, one or two life, you need to start considering things. So if you're at, like, if you're at five, four, three life take a hit. It's okay. <laughs> you have plenty of counter. You have plenty of events to work with. You're probably going to see Marcos, the blocker to fall back on. If things get shaky and you have a new gate in hand, you can always board him for an additional 2k power for your opponent's next turn. So don't be afraid to take a hit. Of course, that's just general, but especially with this deck. The other thing that I would say is definitely look at this deck as a control deck. So you have all these bodies on board that are not hard to make viable swings. And if your opponent is slightly behind you and they make the mistake of overextending and swinging at you, or they're trying to clear your board and you can save something, punish their swings. Go after their characters. And if they try to save them, just keep going after them until they empty their hand. And then you basically have free reign. And you might take some damage for that, but eventually you're just going to be able to pay it back because you have such big bodies. You have plenty of defense. You even have things to help you with control like Red Hawk. Uh, if you have a new gate, of course, that's always good. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to think about with this deck, but those are just general thoughts that I have whenever I'm playing. So yeah, I mean, I would just uh, you know, consider those things. Yeah, that was a lot of good information there, especially going over the different ways in which you use the Teach and how valuable he's been to you in your run. And definitely, like, if Teach sticks, then you're winning. Because, yes. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. I mean, especially you get multiple down, like, yeah, it's just such a big swing. It is value. You know, you're only playing it for four costs. That's on turn two, you know. So generally when I play against you, I 
We'll look for the pistol or the Sakazuki and get rid of that thing as quickly as possible. Um, <laughs> any way that I can. <laughs> so yeah, 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 he uh, he's a huge target. Like you said, you try to get him off the board as quickly as possible. But even in other matchups, like I know the Whitebeard players that are in our locals have really started going in on Fire Fist. But even that doesn't feel too bad because it's like on my two drop turn, I drop Teach. Mm -hmm. And on their next turn, they have to do the Tama Fire Fist yeah. combo. I mean, Fire Fist doesn't normally get rid of Teach, so they have to do even more. And I mean, it takes up their whole turn. They have to burn a 2k counter, mm -hmm. put it on board, which is going to be useless. Mm -hmm. Then they Fire Fist, then they pitch an event as well. Yeah, so even in, the, even in that situation, it's just like, it feels like Teach never loses. Like, he's just really good. Really awesome card. Right. And yeah, we talked a little bit just now about the new gate matchup. So what are some matchup advice? Let's just stick with the new gate first. What's typically the strategy there that you go for? So new gate, the strategy is pretty similar. I mean, you're going to want to really try to dominate in the earlier mid game. Again, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm a broken record here, but getting teach down as soon as you can. I mean, that is an 8k swing and this is even better because those smaller bodies are less viable swingers into Newgate. So whereas a buggy with two Dawn Commitment, one under your leader, one under buggy, swings into a 5k leader just fine, that doesn't go into a Newgate, you know? And so that feels even worse because a two Dawn Commitment becomes a three Dawn Commitment and now you're getting inefficient. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to that, you have the buggy down, you have a teach down, you just load one up under leader, swing with teach, blow up the buggy, and you just, and that's an 8k swing. I mean, he's gonna have to counter with at least two cards unless they have an event. So that's obviously, again, huge. But something that you do do differently into Newgate is uh, King Dew. Um, mm -hmm. So King Dew is incredibly good uh, for Newgate because, again, just for the one Dawn commitment under your leader, that's an 8k swing already. And 8k, of course, is the magic number to go into Newgate. So that's two bodies that you can get out that can get up to 8k without really any issue. Obviously, I don't run that many King Dews, but I also don't see that many Newgates in my locals. I know some people do, and that also might be worth considering adjusting that ratio if you're just seeing a, a really Newgate-heavy local meta, as I know some locals are, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So those are definitely some ways to get value out of those characters even more into Newgate. Otherwise, I mean, it really... Newgate really always is just kind of, are they going to see the pieces that they need to see or aren't they? And it really kind of comes down to that always with Newgate, no matter what they're playing, is like they just have so much ability to block and counter because they also get the blocker Marco. They also have a ton of event counters and they're already a 6k and that's if they didn't even play their Newgate character, which makes them an 8k. So you just have to kind of try to be aggressive in the early game and then hope that you can put the match away at the end but uh, a more interesting matchup in my opinion is the smoker matchup um and that mm -hmm. one you and i are <laughs> are plenty uh experience with at this point yeah those um, are some of the best matches i've ever had are our back and forth with smoker and your zoro yes and i personally consider smoker right now at, at least the way you play it nj to be this deck's worst matchup. Borsalina on Fukuro are really frustrating. You know, with Fukuro, it's like you get no value out of your five drop Marco. You get no like no value out of the teach swing with him. He just gets to stick around. You get no value out of your Red Hawks either. The problem with Smoker is just the ability to really do control better. Obviously, Smoker has just more options for for basically taking over the board. And there's not a ton you can do about most of it. Because unlike the Zoro deck here, when your opponent's playing Smoker, they're not swinging into your bodies so much as they are just dropping their cost and blowing them up. And you don't even have the choice to save them, other than like your Marco. But they're typically not gonna do that. They're <laughs> gonna go for your Teach, of course. Yeah. So um, Smoker is, it's kind of an anomaly. It's, it's really just a matter of not being afraid to take hits. I mean, there was one match with me and NJ here where I was playing at zero life for like a solid, I think it was like three turns before we finally finished the game. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, just a matter of just persistently holding on to that last bit and, and just kind of doing math and hoping the swings go the right way. And so yeah, don't be afraid to take damage. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're taking way too much, way too quickly. But I promise you, when you look at your hand and you're like, I've got like, nine cards in my hand and three of them are event counters that i can save dawn for and my radical beams are active now and like those turns you realize this is why it's okay to take life he's still got to get those last hits in 
And in the meantime, you know, the one thing I will say in, in your advantage uh, playing into Smoker is they have to pitch cards for a lot of those effects. Mm -hmm. And you can really, really punish that. And the way I play Smoker with any deck, because I had to do it the same with Law last set too, is make them pitch more cards. Go into their characters. Don't give them life. Don't give them more cards if you have other options. And it makes sense to do that. Swing a 9K into their 7K double strike smoker. Make them really have to consider if they want to pitch cards to save it uh, before they have to drop their Sakazuki on their next turn and pitch another card. And all they've gotten was one draw between them. You mm -hmm. know, things like that are uh, super worth considering when it comes to smoker. Play to your advantage, which is trying to get them out of hand as much as you possibly can. And then you, you kind of just take over at that point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to go down to one life to do it. Yep. Other matchups, I mean... I guess the elephant in the room is yellow, and yellow is... I don't know if there's any exciting things to say about the matchup. You kind of just play the deck the same way I've been saying this whole time. Don't be afraid to swing into, like, Paro Sparrow. I know that sometimes it seems like it's a little scary giving them an extra card, but if it's like that's all that's standing in the way of you being the only one with a character on board, just... KO the Pair of Sparrow, it's fine. Like, give him the other card. It is, it's not like Smoker, where, like, that's your your goal, is to get him out of hand. Though, you might be able to play him that way, too, because they do have to pitch cards for their, for some of their triggers. But there's, like, one interesting thing in the last matchup that I had against the Katakuri deck was I tried to make it feel really bad for them to play their Big Mom card. And the way I did that was I essentially got them to the point where they didn't have much on board i think they have like one 5k character it might have been like might have been a para sparrow and we were getting into our later turns and i had managed to hold on to by this point i think two life and they had i think three and i dropped my new gate on curve which you know sometimes for some reason i feel like people like have trouble doing that because it is a big dawn commitment and you're not even able to save a lot back for your event counters but I made it feel really bad for them to drop their 10k Big Mom because that was their whole turn. And sure, you gain a life and I lose one. But again, you know, if you've saved up your cards and you have your event counters and you have your Marcos on board and stuff, it's like, who cares that you have a big Big Mom and an extra life? I'm just going to like, I'm going to go in on my next turn. And you don't even get to do anything on that turn because I'm sitting at 7k um, and you all you, you had to spend all your dawn to drop a 10k and now none of your 5k cards can but other than that, I mean, that matchup really comes down to, like, did they see godly triggers or did they see mediocre to no great triggers, you know? like that, And that, I feel like a lot of yellow matchups come down to that. It's like, what kind of triggers did they see? Mm -hmm. And I just feel like Katakuri is not as efficient as uh, getting to decide what their triggers are. I mean, they can decide what isn't going to be on top of their life, I guess. But otherwise, it's up to chance. After that, you just kind of play to your, to your strengths, uh, control the board, and then just go in on life when you can, and hope they don't trigger uh, Thunderbolts and stuff. Yeah, uh, that was a good description of some of these matchups. Uh, Newgate, like you said, we don't have a huge showing of Newgate in our locals, but we do have one player, Michael, who is dedicated to <laughs> it, and he's really good with it. Definitely yeah. tough to beat. But yeah, Newgate, it is a matchup that we know about and you know you can go into their board if you get them down to an attacker or two and force them to pitch cards and wear them down then you can hide behind your wall of marcos and i kind of feel the same about katakuri if you limit them to you know one to two swings and just hide behind your marcos you could just wear them down eventually and yeah obviously i played a lot of smokers so far in this set and yeah. the thing about smokers just like you said it's like, force me to pitch more cards than I want to at times. Like, uh, you know, take a turn to swing into characters that I think are really important and obviously ones that you view as threats. And, you know, black still doesn't have the best counters. A lot of the best cards in black have no counter, like Isho, Sakazuki, Kuzan. So many cards in black that are good don't have counters. So you're mostly just sticking with your 2Ks and then your events. So... If that's the case, then you know, you're know you gonna wear them down with a lot of small swings, and obviously Zoro's capable of small swings. But mm -hmm. yeah, so um, those are definitely three good matchups to talk about, and definitely ones that have come up in your run, I would say. Oh yeah, plenty. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But yeah, we got one more store championships this week, I believe. And we'll see if you can get a third. I know we're all we're all banding together. We're like, we gotta stop this man. <laughs> but yeah, no, not really. Uh, I, I'm playing in it, but um, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll maybe I'll switch things around. We'll see what happens. <laughs> no, I, man, I go for it. Them, if I were you, I would go for it <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but yeah, definitely impressive and another strong start for you. You seem to really take off at the beginning of every new set and you you got it figured out in that sense but yeah um i think that was a good discussion on zoro for opo3 is there anything else you'd want to say about the deck it feels a lot more fun this time around like mm -hmm. i played zoro at the beginning of set two as well and i didn't hate it it wasn't like how i felt about newgate i just newgate it felt like it was totally boring Mm -hmm. Zoro was, you know, it was fun, but it wasn't Law. Like, to me, Law's, you know, so much fun. But this version of Zoro is a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, there's turns where you get to drop. It's like turn one, you get to drop an Izo. Turn two, you get to drop, like, a Dadon. And then you get to get a buggy and then drop the buggy. And you're just searching through your deck and finding all your pieces and just watching the game plan unfold. And it's like, to me, that is just a ton of fun. And then... The Teach card, I feel like it's one that's not being talked about a ton. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a little slept on personally, but when you play with it, you'll understand. You'll see the power that it uh, that it provides. I mean, other than that, I think the deck is great. I especially think it's really good right now into everything that we've seen so far for the meta. We'll see how it shakes out. I mean, of course, the meta is going to develop, and a month from now, this deck could be totally obsolete, and we'll see what happens. But uh, for now, this, this uh, deck is a lot of fun, and performed well so yeah no i know we've been talking a lot about that marshall d teach card the new card but it is <laughs> like you know it it's funny right before anything even started i was like what do you guys think about this card and i was like i think it's pretty good but i don't see you know there's so many good cards in red i just don't yeah. see how to fit it in and then you've just been dominating with it so it's <laughs> like Okay, I see it now, especially in, when you do it in person. It's like, this is an amazing card. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, we all have our cards that we like, too, that we stick to. And, you know, for me, it was right. always Hawkins and Green. And now, like, the five-cost smoker I really enjoy. So, for you, I guess it's this Marshall D. Teach, and for good reason, it's a powerful card. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and then just, just as a One Piece fan, too, I love the art. <laughs> the art is awesome. Yeah. Um, Thatch in the background holding the, the darkness, darkness fruit is really cool, so. Um, I didn't even notice so yeah, that. I mean, I'm going to have to go back and look at that card. I know the, the artwork on the Marshall D. Teach himself is really good. So. Yep, yep, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it is, I've, I've said it multiple times already, um, but at least as of right now, it is definitely my favorite card in set three, so. Yeah, hopefully uh, you make a believer out of others that, you know, aren't playing it. Because like you said, it's a card that hasn't been talked about enough, probably. But, alright, well, yeah, I appreciate having you on and collaborating with me on another deck profile. And congratulations again on your two store championship victories. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, anytime, I, I, I love being on the channel. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's always good to have you on. And let me know in the comments section below what you think of Steven's deck and what are your thoughts on Marshall D. Teach in this meta. I'd love to know. So yeah, uh, if you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and consider subscribing for more One Piece card game content. And I'll see you all in the next video.